This is episode number 53 of the Fine Dining Podcast, and it's all about honey. This is the Fine Dining Podcast. The Fine Dining Podcast. For foodies who love travel and travelers who love food. Here's your host, Seth Ressler. Hello, and welcome to the Fine Dining Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Seth Ressler, and this is the podcast for foodies who love travel travelers who love food. Uh, Each week we go to a different city, we talk to a food expert, and we find out everything about their town. But this week, we're doing something different. We've got the big Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference, the nation's first food tourism conference, coming up in Providence, Rhode Island this fall. We're really excited about it. You can find all the details at tastetrekkers.com. And I have joining me today one of the speakers who's going to be at the Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference, Marina Marchese of Red Bee Honey. And so we're going to talk all about honey today. Marina, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. So you've got a lot going on. I mean, you're the author of uh, two books now. Uh, The first is Honey Bee, Lessons of an Accidental Beekeeper. And then you've got a new book out called The Honey Connoisseur. So congratulations on the new book. Thank you. It's uh, it's definitely uh, a labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get into that. We're going to talk a little bit about the book. You're also the founder of the American Honey Tasting Society. And among other things, you run the Red Bee Apiary up there in Connecticut. Yeah. Keeping bees, making honey, teaching people about honey. Definitely a busy bee. <laughs> There's a great video on your website from ABC's The Chew, where they actually came out to your apiary, and it's fantastic. So if people want to see what it's all about, they can watch it on your website. Uh, so we are going to talk to you about uh, basically you and how you got into beekeeping and, and what you're doing. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about honey tasting, because I don't even think a lot of people know that that's a thing. I mean, it's almost like wine tasting. Not all honey's the same. And so we're going to get into that and talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then we're going to play a game called Out of the Frying Pan. All right, you ready for that, too? We're ready. <laughs> all right. Before we do all that, I know you've got a trivia question for me. What is it? Seth, how much honey does one worker bee make in her entire life? How much honey does one worker bee? I assume you measure this in pounds. Well, let's measure it in teaspoons or tablespoons. Oh, okay. Teaspoons or tablespoons. Very little. Oh, it's little? Lots of work for very little honey. Well, then I'm already wrong. Uh, boy, I was, uh, hmm, uh, really? It, it's little. And how long, is, what's the lifespan of a, of a bee? Typically, a, a honey bee will live about six weeks, but the last three weeks of their life, they become foraging bees, and those are the bees that leave the hive and go gather the nectar to make honey. So in that three-week period, how much honey would a worker bee make in her life, in her three weeks of foraging? I got to think about that because I actually, I thought the answer was going to be big. I thought, <laughs> when I said pounds, I thought you were going to say, no, we measure it in tons. So I'm, I'm clearly, <laughs> <laughs> clearly I'm way off. So let me give that some thought. We're going to come back to that. In the meantime, uh, let's talk about you because I know you're, you call yourself an accidental beekeeper. How did you get into this? Well, about 13 years ago, one of my neighbors invited me to visit their honeybees. And um, I live here in Western Connecticut. And I went to art school, and I had a pretty good career as a designer, and I was traveling. I I spent some time in Asia, and I was going back and forth to New York as well. And, you know, business was changing, and times were kind of tough, and I was thinking, you know, what can I get into? And I really was just sort of searching, and this neighbor invited me over to come visit their honeybees. And this was about 13 years ago, before we were into the organic and the green movement and farmer's market. So when somebody said they were a beekeeper, it wasn't really as popular as it is now. It's actually trending right now. Really? It's, it's trending? It's becoming a, a thing? Yeah, honey. Beekeeping is, you know, one of the big homesteading movements right now. Wow. Really, really popular. So back then, you know, before we were really into the organic green movement and going to farmer's markets every week, you know, someone who said they were a beekeeper was sort of, you know, thinking like the retired gentleman, you know, taking care of bees on the weekend. You know, like most people, I was completely afraid of honeybees and all stinging insects. I knew nothing about them. But there was something intriguing about beekeeping, like just hearing someone say it. So I took a ride over there and My neighbor was sitting in the driveway with his bee hat, and he handed me one of those bee veils, the protective veils that beekeepers wear. 
And we started walking through his garden over to these wooden boxes in his yard. And those were his beehives. And for me, I had no idea what a beehive looked like. They looked like file cabinets to me in his garden. (laughs) Kind of ridiculous. And he said to me, honeybees are really curious creatures. They like to crawl into the nooks and crannies of our clothing. And he's telling me that the veils are going to stop them from stinging our faces. And I thought, what am I getting myself into? (laughs) I was was really scared. I would be too. I would be, I mean, this is... I don't know. It's it was freaky. Edgy. It was kind of edgy. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I can do this. You know, like, this is just crazy. And the neighbors were really nice people. So I totally had all my trust into them. So we walk over to the hive with our bee veils on, feeling a little geeky, you know. And he takes his bee smoker. He smokes the front of the hive. You've seen the beekeepers do that in the movies. He lifts the lid off the hive with his bare hands. And there's thousands of bees crawling all over the top of the box. And the first thing that struck me was, oh, my gosh, they're going to come after us and, you know, swarm us or something. And they didn't. They just minded their own business. They were just crawling all over them, the top of the wood. And I thought, wow. And I said to him, so why aren't the bees swarming and attacking us? And he says to me, honeybees are not native to the U.S. They were brought here hundreds of years ago. And many of them came on the Mayflower, and he said, my honeybees are Italian honeybees. And I thought, what? Pedigree honeybees? So the story starts getting even more interesting. And, you know, he started telling me that most of the honeybees here in the United States that are raised by beekeepers are Italian. And I thought, that's really interesting, Italian bees. Yeah. So, you know, just the first thing of seeing the bees not attack us was interesting. You know, he pulls out the frames with his bare hands, and you've seen pictures of the beekeeper holding that box, you know, with the bees on it. And they're crawling all over, and they're going on his hands, and he's calm about it. And, you know, he's telling me about the queen, and, and she's the mother of all the bees, and every hive has one queen. And he's telling me about the worker bees. The females do all the work. They clean the hive. They raise the young. They gather the nectar to make honey. They gather pollen to pollinate, and they do all the work in the hive. And then the drone bees, which are the male bees, don't contribute to anything except mating with the queen, who is the only fertile bee in the hive. It's kind of like American society. Yeah, exactly. And I'm listening. It sounds like a soap opera. You know, you've got the queen, and she lays all the eggs, and the workers do all the work, and the drones, they just mate with the queen, and they die in the act of mating. So the whole story was really kind of fascinating. And the last thing he he said to me, do you want to taste the fresh honey in the hive? And I said, yeah, absolutely. That sounds like the best part of this whole thing. So, you know, he shows me where they store the honey in the wax and he stuck his finger in it and he took his finger and put it under his veil and he tasted the honey and he said, do you want to try some? So I stick my finger in and I forget that I have this veil on and I smear the honey on the front of the veil and he starts laughing and so I stuck my finger in again and when I tasted the fresh honey, it was like the most delicious, freshest, most delicate honey that I had ever had in my entire life. And just being outside in the warm sun and the heat, you know, and the warm honey was just like an amazing experience. Like, you know, I grew up like most people with the plastic honey bear in the cabinet, you know, and it crystallizes and you just end up like never using it and throwing it away. Right. But this was like a completely amazing experience. So the next thing I said to him was, you know, so... You've got this honey. Do you have to pasteurize it or boil it? Or do you have to do some special preparation before you can really eat it or sell it? And he said, no, you know, honey is just a raw product. You literally just take it out of the hive and you spin it out of the wax and you bottle it. And that's it. And it never needs refrigeration and it never spoils. And I was like, wow, this is really getting to be much more interesting than I thought. So that day I left and I took a bottle of his honey home and I just, you know, became completely enamored with this whole concept of having these little creatures in the garden making honey. And he was prompting me to really get started and get a hive. And I thought, well, I'm still traveling. I'm away for three weeks out of the year. 
you know, even more maybe, and I'm back and forth, I, I wouldn't really be able to take care of them. And he just assured me that you really didn't need to take care of bees every day, that you could visit them once or twice a month and they'd get by. They would just, you know, take care of themselves. Right. So I ended up taking the plunge and I get this one hive of bees and I build my little wooden beehive. And So wait, one hive, you know, how big is that and how many bees are we talking about? So you get one wooden box, which is a hive. It literally looks like maybe a file cabinet, those, you know, tall metal with the drawers, two drawers on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And it's just one hive and you buy the wood and it's all pre-cut. Basically, you get hammer and nails and you just assemble the pieces. It's quite easy. It takes about three hours. And then you paint it or you stain it and then you go out and you buy yourself a package of bees. Where do you get this? You just go to Amazon.com and... Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, my mentor helped me get a package of bees. But if you join a bee club or you network with beekeepers, as I said, it's so wildly popular right now. It's not difficult. There's people that will sell you bees. But there's bee farms mostly down in Georgia, Texas, all over. And they they breed bees, and they sell them in three pound packages, which is uh, looks like a shoebox. So a shoebox shows up in the mail, and it's buzzing, and it's just got bees in it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Wow. <laughs> you know, at the time, that's what I wrote in my first book. When I got my first package of bees, I went to the post office, and I picked up a live buzzing box of bees and the people in the post office were absolutely flipped out. <laughs> I'll bet. And and very happy to see me leave with them. <laughs> so today mostly people are getting them from clubs. Like there'll be a person who will drive down to Georgia or somewhere and buy hundreds of boxes of bees and, and distribute them through the network of a bee club. And how many bees go into your first uh your first hive? So your first box of bees is about 20,000 bees, 18,000 bees. There's one queen, and it's mostly the workers who are doing all the work, and a small portion of them is the drone bees. So you actually, you know, pour the bees into your box or into your hive, and there's a little ritual that goes into it. You know, the queen travels in her own little box. It's called a queen cage. And she has some female attendants in there that will feed and groom her. I'm just trying to think of whose job it is is to go, they got to check 20,000 bees and make sure there's one queen in every box. Like, that sounds difficult. Well, you know, it's really interesting because the more that you work with bees and the more that you keep bees, you learn behavior. So you can actually go up to the front of a hive and you can observe the behavior of the bees coming in and out. You can maybe lift the lid off and look inside. And just with an experienced eye, you can really tell what is going on in the hive, the health of it, the productivity of it. You know, it's something that you you learn. You know, if you have a dog, you know how your dog is behaving. You know when your dog is barking and what kind of bark that is or your cat. Right. It's the same thing with bees. When you work day in and day out, season after season with them, and you really pay attention You can sort of read what's going on in the hive without having to open up the hive and look for the queen. There's signs. So give me an example. Like, like what's something that you've seen over the years where you said, oh, maybe something's not right or... Well, the first thing I like to do is when I approach the hive, I like to look at the entrance. I like to see bees coming in and out. Um, If you see them coming in and out where the activity just looks peaceful... And they tend to be going in with pollen on their legs. They carry the pollen on their back legs. That's always a really good sign. You don't want to see any other insects trying to get into the hive. That's called robbing. And other insects or other bees might be fighting at the entrance of the hive, which is not really a good sign. So, you know, there's a lot of different signs to look for as you become more experienced as a beekeeper. And when you do a hive inspection, if you see signs of eggs or larva or capped brood and honey and pollen, those are all the signs that you want to look for that your hive is healthy and balanced if you can't necessarily find the queen during every inspection because there's one queen and at at a certain point in the summer, you could have up to 60, 70,000 bees in the hive. Now, how does a bee become queen? I mean, I assume they don't hold elections. 
<laughs> Essentially, uh, any worker female bee egg can be turned into a queen by feeding her royal jelly. Sounds like a, a fairy tale. But when the queen lays eggs, some of them are fertilized and some of them are not fertilized. The fertilized eggs become worker female bees. If for some reason within the colony, the present queen, she dies, she gets lost on her mating flight, a bird eats her, she is just not healthy or productive, the colony will sense that. And what they'll do is they will sort of kill her. They'll ball her. They'll, they'll suffocate her. And they'll turn around and take one of her female eggs. And they will continue to feed it royal jelly, and that gives it longevity and fertility so it can be a fertile queen. That's a coup that you're talking about. (laughs) It's crazy, yeah. So basically, if you're not a healthy, productive queen, your colony will know it, and they will get rid of you and replace you. Wow. There's so many interesting things that, you know, go on in the beehive and with the colony that we have so many misconceptions. Our culture has has taught us to be so fearful of stinging insects when, in fact, honeybees will sting. They'll sting you once, but they will die. And if people say, you know, I was out in the pool or I was mowing the lawn and I got stung like five times for a nest, that's not a honeybee. Those are most likely wasp or yellow jack. What about these these killer bees that were supposed to be coming up from South America and never seem to get here? Well, they're here. They're down in Ventura County. They're in Arizona. They're in Texas. They're in Florida. But I don't hear a lot of, you know, stories about death by bee down there. Occasionally, we do hear it. And they're basically Africanized bees that were let go, you know, ended up in Brazil. A couple of queens had gotten loose in Brazil, and they slowly started to mate with our European domestic bees and move up north, and slowly what they do is they integrate themselves and and mate with our our European bees, and we get certain colonies that we call hot hives. So sometimes we don't know unless they're tested genetically, but sometimes beekeepers will have a colony of bees that are a little on the uh, defensive side. The beekeepers in Mexico and southern uh, South America and many of them in the southern United States are managing and keeping bees that are Africanized. They've learned to work with them because they have no choice. And then what about, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of stories over the last few years about uh, bee populations dying out. And some people thought it was cell phone signals and other things. What's the story there? Well, you know, bees are... Bees are dying. It's, it's bit getting very difficult for beekeepers to keep their colonies alive, and there's many, many different environmental issues. One of the biggest problems is uh, big ag chemicals, pesticides, fungicides. Not only bees are getting sick and dying, you know, we've got bats and birds and we've got people. There's also something called the varroa mite, which is sort of a, a bee like a tick, and it infests the hive, and it it sticks to the bees, and it sucks their blood. Are we seeing a decline in bee populations worldwide then? Yes. It's all over the world. I want to say it's a little bit more pronounced here in the United States, but it's all over because of chemicals. They're saying, you know, they say they're pointing at GMO crops. They're pointing at, uh, you know, pesticides on the farms because the farmers are using so many chemicals. So when the bees are out there pollinating, they're getting, um, you know, chemicals in their body, bringing it back to the hive. Most of them are not even getting back to the hive. They're dying in the field. So one of the symptoms of colony collapse disorder is beekeepers visiting their hives and saying, where's all my bees? There's not a bee in there. Well, they died in the field getting chemicals, being on the flower. The colony collapse is mostly the the, uh, big commercial beekeepers that are pushing bees across the country 
from crop to crop. They started almonds in California, and then they go up for blueberries, and they're going down for apples, and they're going to Florida for oranges. And they're- This was one of my questions for you is, um, you know, what does the beekeeping industry look like? Is it mostly uh, small mom-and-pop beekeepers, or are there big corporate beekeepers that just do, you know, is there a Monsanto well, of beekeepers or something like that? Well, most of the big, big ag crops are pollinated by a handful of commercial beekeepers. And these are people who have, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of hives. Some have thousands of hives, and they move them to specific farms and fields for pollination services, and their job is mostly pollination. They get paid to pollinate. They're not really interested in the honey so much. There's no money in honey. There's money in pollination. And they're family businesses. Some of these people are third, fourth generation beekeepers, and their livelihood is managing thousands of beehives and pollination contracts with farms all over the country. So they're moving bees all over the place. And these are the people who are really seeing the problem with the bees disappearing. And then most beekeepers are hobbyist beekeepers or backyard beekeepers. And those are people who basically are hobbyists. And I have a general idea of what you mean when you say pollination, but talk to me a little bit more about how specifically that works. Yeah, pollination is like a word that we throw around so much. And I can say, honestly, when I started keeping bees, I was like, oh, yeah, pollination. I didn't know really what the heck it was. But quite simply, what it is is when bees are out in the garden, honeybees specifically, They have these hairy bodies, and when they go to a flower, all of that little dust or pollen sticks to their bodies. And when they go from flower to flower, they move it. And pollination is essentially fertilizing a plant so that it can grow a fruit or a vegetable. So those flowers require pollen to be moved, the female to the male. It becomes an act of fertilization, and that's how we get a pear, how we get an apple, how we get a zucchini, how we get a blueberry. Without that pollen moving and fertilizing the plant, the flower, we don't get food. And are bees the only animals that do this pollination, or are they the primary, or, uh, I mean, how important is their role in pollination? Honeybees are very important for a couple of reasons. The wind does pollinate a certain amount of plants, And then we've got thousands of native bees like, you know, bumblebees and sweat bees and all kinds of other bees and birds and hummingbirds and bats and moths. They do a certain amount of pollination. But honeybees specifically are excellent because, A, they have these hairy bodies that they don't try to pollinate. They're just basically gathering nectar to make honey. And in the act of gathering nectar, they're pollinating. And honeybees have this behavior where when a worker leaves her colony in the morning, if she decides she's going to go to clover, she'll go to clover to clover to clover. And that creates cross-pollination among clover, which is what you really want. Other bees might go clover to dandelion, to a tree, to a, a wildflower, but honeybees will do that. The other thing is honeybees can be moved. They're in those boxes or those hives. So a farmer in California who might have uh, avocados can say, hire a beekeeper to bring in bees for the bloom of the avocado, which is a very specific period of time. When flowers bloom, they only bloom for about two or three weeks. And then after that, they drop their flowers, their petals, and then you have an avocado. So in that specific period of time, the bees have to be there and they have to be ready when the flower is giving off the pollen. So honeybees can be moved, whereas wild bees, native bees, you can't just go up into a tree and say, hey, you know, can you come pollinate the avocados? (laughs) But with a honeybee, you can actually move the boxes right there while they're blooming. And that's how you get them to pollinate specifically what's blooming at that time. Are there any other seasonality aspects to bees? I mean, do they do different things in in different times of year? Is it just different crops? I mean, they don't migrate or anything like that, do they? Well, they basically always go back to their queen in their own hive. 
And what's important is that throughout the season, there must be, for a healthy colony to survive, there must be a variety of different things blooming throughout the year. And you don't have to really be a gardener to know that if you have a flower growing in your yard, that flower is only going to be there for a week or two, and then it drops its petals and it dies, and then something else blooms. So the, the timing is really important. So for backyard beekeepers, it's really important to plant a lot of things that are going to bloom consistently over the season so that your bees have a source of nectar and pollen throughout the whole season. So you plant some things that'll bloom in the spring, you plant other things in the summer, other things that'll come out in the fall, so the bees can sort of eat all season. And now you're up there in Connecticut where it snows in the winter. What happens when there's snow on the ground? Essentially, the bees stay inside the colony and they make a cluster, they stay warm, and they just kind of hang out in the hive until spring comes. And it's not really a hibernation, but it's, uh, you know, a low activity where they just kind of hang out inside the hive. Well, this is fascinating. I can talk about bees forever, but we also have to talk about honey. We so. talk about honey. <laughs> it sucks you in. It totally just, does. I'm fascinated. I, I want to know everything about this I, now. This is what happened to me. This is how I became the accidental beekeeper. It took over my life. So we are going to come back in just a second. We're going to answer your trivia question. And we're going to start talking about honey, and we've got a game called Out of the Frying Pan coming up soon, too. Before we get back to Marina Marchese, I want to tell you about the Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference. Now, this is the nation's first event just for people who plan their travel, who plan their vacations around food. If that's you, you absolutely want to be at this event. It's happening September 20th, 21st, and 22nd in Providence, Rhode Island. Marina is going to be one of our speakers there. She's going to be leading a session, and we've got all kinds of cool sessions, all kinds of cool speakers there. Matt Jennings, uh, the chef over at Farmstead, which is absolutely absolutely fantastic. He's been nominated for James Beard a number of times. He won the Koshan 555 competition three times in a row. He's going to be delivering the keynote speech. Uh, go go look at all the sessions we've got. They're fantastic. We've got uh, an instructor from Johnson & Wales University who is going to be talking about the chocolate of Madagascar. We've got a session on ceviche from Peru and Bolivia. We've got a session on the history of rum in New England. I mean, it's going to be fantastic. Go check it out. The website is tastetrekkers.com. T-A-S-T-T-R-E-K-K-E-R-S dot com. And we hope to see you there in September. Okay, we are talking to Marina Marchese of Red Bee Honey. She is one of the speakers at this year's, uh, at this year's, the very first ever Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference. It's happening September 20th, 21st, and 22nd in Providence, Rhode Island. And we've been talking about bees. Uh, before we turn to honey, you had a trivia question for me. What was it? How much honey does a female worker bee make in her entire short life of foraging, her, her foraging life? She's only foraging for three weeks. Yes, and she'll go out every day as long as it's nice. Approximately how much honey would one little bee make? Well, and before we answer that, let me ask, how do they make honey? Like, what exactly happens? <laughs> <laughs> We're going back to it. So there's certain scout bees that are females. They'll go scouting around the yard. They will smell some very attractive nectar at a flower. They'll stop. They'll sip some of that nectar, carry it back to the hive in their stomach, and they'll go and they'll do the bee dance. And you've heard about bee dances. And this is how they communicate to the other forager bees where the source is. And the dance breaks down to telling them where the source is in relationship to the hive and the sun. So a forager bee will get a a taste of that honey from that dancer, and she will take it and she will go try to find the source. And she will again go and suck up some of the nectar with her tongue and carry it back to the hive in her honey stomach. Yeah. And she'll get back to the hive In the flight, returning back to the hive, she'll mix some of her own enzymes into the nectar. She'll hand it over to a younger house bee who will accept that nectar, add some of her enzymes. They'll put that watery nectar in a wax cell, in a honeycomb cell, and the water content's really much higher than it should be to make honey. So what they do is they flap their wings, they evaporate some of the water content of the nectar, 
add some more enzymes to cure it, and it turns it into honey. Then they tap it into the wax cells. They'll close it up until they need it. So basically, it's just gathering nectar, adding some enzymes, and evaporating the water content to about 17, 18%, and then capping it up so that it stays clean and safe. What do bees use honey for? I mean, if we didn't come along and eat it. It's their source of carbohydrates, and the pollen is their source of protein. So they'll eat it if we don't. They eat it. But we don't take honey from the nest. We take excess honey. And honeybees will hoard honey if the temperature and the environment and the the, the source of nectar is available. They will continue making honey. So the question is, how much honey would a bee make? You know, how many trips back and forth are they making to the flower in an average day? They could make hundreds. Hmm. So, and a bee stomach's not that big. I'm going to, I'm just going to guess. You said it was measured in tablespoons? To give you a ballpark, it could be tablespoons, it could be cups, it could be ounces, but it's not tons and pounds. I'll say two tablespoons. They make about a twelfth of a teaspoon (laughs) in their entire life. So when you learn about that, when you actually grasp that, You've got to believe that honey is a very valuable and very rare commodity. Right. True honey, not teddy bear, grocery store, plastic honey bear. Well, I I mean, are the big companies doing something to sort of, you know, I mean, not like watering it down, essentially? Yes. And that's a whole chapter in my book, The Honey Connoisseur, about the things that happen to honey. The things that do happen and can happen to the honey that ends up on the grocery store shelf, without naming names. Gotcha. Let's talk about honey tasting, because I know, you know, and you you and I have talked a little bit about this before, that, uh, for example, the way people taste honey in Europe is different than the way people taste honey here. That there's actually almost like wine tastings, uh, there's honey tastings. Yeah, so, you know, as I kept bees and I got my first honey harvest, I really started to realize how rare and how special this product really was. And, you know, how could it be in the grocery store for only $3 or $4? And then I learned that, you know, that really wasn't 100% pure beekeeper's honey. And uh, I just became fascinated on the notion of different kinds of honey because the honey that I would harvest here was a wildflower, meaning it was a combination of all the different flowers that were blooming through the season. But as I met beekeepers and I started traveling and going to beekeeping conferences and I was trading honey with other beekeepers, I started to notice that certain people had honeys that were darker or lighter or they came from other floral sources that maybe were not from my particular area. So I noticed that honey started to taste different as I would get it from different places. So I um, was so curious about this. I had found out that there was a honey show in London, the National Honey Show. So about 2003, I went to London to the honey show. And um, they had honey judging and honey tasting. and, And I had never seen this before in the United States. I knew that they had honey contests and, you know, farmers markets and 4-H clubs would have little honey, you know, competitions, but not at the level that I saw that that was happening in London. And uh, they had honey on display that was ready, prepared specifically for tasting and judging. And I couldn't believe the variety of colors of the honeys from the different places around the country, but also around the world. And I met some of the honey judges, and these are people who are trained in tasting honey, much like the same way we would taste wine here in the United States. And I had never seen this done before, and um, I got some information on, uh, you know, the criteria for actually tasting honey, very, very similar to what you would do for tasting wine or olive oil or tea or chocolate. Right. But um, I had just never seen it done with honey, and I just um, became really fascinated with the concept. But it was when I went to Montalcino in Italy a couple of years later that I stumbled upon a honey festival there, and the whole notion of really tasting honey the way we would do with wine and taking notes and assessing the color, the aroma, the flavor, 
and also trying to really understand the floral source and the, the flavor profile that directly relates to that floral source of the honey. So I really have been fascinated with this notion of, you know, different honey and different honey plants and the flavor profiles and the regions that they come from. And in the book, The Honey Connoisseur, I, my co-author, Kim Flottam, who's the editor of Bee Culture magazine, he's a real plant person as well as a beekeeper, but we explored the whole concept of the terroir of honey the same way you would do it with olive oil or wine. So let me ask you then, what influences or makes one honey taste different from another? Is it the breed of bee? Is it the uh, type of plant that they're pollinating? It's essentially the plant. Okay. With wine, it's the wine grape. With honey, it's the plant. But um, different plants are endemic to certain areas. And for people who might not know what I'm talking about, um, think simply about orange blossom honey. You have oranges that grow in Florida and, you know, the bees down there are making orange blossom honey. You're not going to have orange honey up in Maine because we just can't grow oranges in Maine. So this makes sense. So honeys from different regions will taste different because there's different plants in different regions. Yes, and if you take an orange blossom honey from Florida and another orange blossom from maybe Southern California or Arizona, although it's honey made from the nectar of an orange tree, the honey still tastes different because of the, the, the terroir, the soil, the temperature, the climate. So if you taste side by side an orange blossom honey from Florida and then another one from the deserts of Arizona and then say another orange from maybe the Mediterranean, they will all taste a little bit different because of the terroir, the region, the soil, the climate. And this is really fascinating because we never think of honey in that way. We just think, you know, okay, orange honey is orange honey, but depending on where it's harvested, it can take on a completely different flavor profile. Now, how many different flavors can one apiary make? I mean, for example, what are you doing up there at Red Bee? Because I've noticed that you've got a number of different honeys. Well, what we make is essentially a wildflower honey. And um, our wildflower tends to be on the lighter side because we have a lot of black locusts and linden trees. And we're sort of in a suburban area. But the honeys that we offer are honeys that we, what we specialize in is the single origin nectar source honeys and working with beekeepers who are pollinators. And these are people who are specifically taking bees to fields or farms where there are unique nectar sources for bees. So we really are looking for very rare honeys and very unique flavor profiles. And that's what we specialize in. And most of the honeys that we sell are limited harvest. For example, we put bees um, in a vineyard where the winemaker makes a red currant wine. And bees don't necessarily pollinate wine grapes, but the currant they will pollinate and they will gather nectar from. So when we got the honey harvested from this red currant vineyard, the honey tastes like a red currant. It has notes of anise. It has some notes of sour cherries, cranberries. It's truly a unique flavor experience in a honey, and it's something that you'll never find. We're hoping that we can return next year when the red currants are blooming again and that the bees will make a honey just as delicious. But, you know, we don't know until next year. So there are beekeepers who are, you know, literally experimenting with this, saying, hey, you know, let's try releasing some bees, you know, around this particular plant and see what we get in terms of flavor. You know, it's starting to happen. It, this is a very European concept of really spending the time and tasting and identifying the floral sources of your honey. And as I go around to conferences and I talk to beekeepers, and I do this often, I travel and I, and I visit beekeepers, I'll drop in on apiaries, and, and that's what beekeepers do. We just go visit each other. But I'm really interested in the floral sources and the honeys. And it's pretty, it's pretty interesting that most beekeepers, we really haven't explored that. There's really not a resource that a beekeeper can go to. There's not a book that is going to talk about 
what honey plants are in my area and what kind of honey my bees are making. And that's what our book does. Our book is a resource for beekeepers to start to get a primer on what's blooming in my area and what my honey looks like, what it tastes like, and how to identify it and market it as such. You know, this is also a book for foodies who are people that want to travel and have food experiences and to maybe travel to different parts of the United States and have a honey tasting experience of what kind of honeys are being harvested in that region. It's endless how many honeys we can talk about, but we we feature 30 of the most important honey plants from different regions around the United States. And we want beekeepers to start learning about their honey plants and their honey. And we want food lovers and and food travelers to, you know, try the honeys when when they travel. Go visit a farmer's market. Go visit a beekeeper. Taste the region. Get a taste of what the floral sources are of that region at that particular season. So this was really the whole goal of the book, and it's really, it's kind of an untouched, untapped area. This is fascinating, and I'm so excited that you're coming to the Taste Trekkers Conference to talk about all this, because this really is, you know, I mean, to be honest, as I was putting the conference together, this is not something that was top of mind, and then, you know, when you approached me and said, you know, told me about what you did, I was fascinated by it, and I think people are going to be really into this. Thank you. People can actually go to apiaries. For example, uh, I know that there are times where people can go to yours, correct? We actually open up our apiary to visit on specific times. We have something called a talk tour and tasting that we do throughout the season. And people come from all over. We We have visitors come from all over the country. We've had people come from Canada. And they can get a small tour of our apiary and our gardens and our chickens and they can ask questions and we talk about bees and honey and we sit down and we do these formal honey tastings where we treat everybody to a tasting of um, seven different regional honeys from the United States and, and we pair them up with local foods and especially cheeses. And uh, we convert people into honey connoisseurs, <laughs> essentially. Very cool. All right. Well, I'm excited to see this at the conference. Now, are you ready to play a little game? I'm ready. <laughs> okay, this game is called Out of the Frying Pan. Here's how it works. I'm going to ask you for a series of rapid-fire recommendations. Just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. And we're talking about the area around uh, the Red Bee Ape area where you are, which is up in Western Connecticut. Tell me a little bit about that area. I mean, where is that for people who don't know? Weston is about an hour from New York City, sort of next to Westport, Connecticut, on the water, the Gold Coast. And we're located in Fairfield County, which is uh, quite a food locavore paradise. We have some very serious farm-to-table restaurants and farmer's markets, and we have quite a few farms and vineyards here. So it's, it's a really nice foodie destination. All right, well, let's start with that. Here's our first question. If somebody's coming up to uh, see your apiary, name one other foodie thing that they should make sure they do while they're in the area. Um, I would say check out any of the farm-to-table restaurants in our area. Do you want some specific names? Yeah, give me give me some farm-to-table restaurants up there that we should check out. Well, we have La Farm, which is a really fabulous farm-to-table restaurant here right in Westport, Connecticut. We have something called Artisan Del Mar which is a high-end uh, farm-to-table restaurant. you have a favorite chef up there? We sell honey to quite a few of the chefs up here. I would say my best customer, my longest customer, who has really sort of gotten what we're doing here with honey is Bill Taby from La Farm. You mentioned cheese and pairing cheese with honey. Where's your favorite place to buy cheeses? We have quite a few, um, and I do a lot of honey tasting uh, classes with them where we pair up with cheeses. We have Fairfield cheese. I recently did something with 109 cheese. 109 is in Ridgefield, and Fairfield Cheese Company is in Fairfield. Okay, besides uh, the honey that you produce there at Red Bee, name another honey, an artisanal honey, that we should be sure to try. There are so many amazing honeys, and it really depends on your region because a lot of the honeys that we talk about in the book, you're not going to find in the grocery store. They're national treasures. I mean, we've all heard about Tupelo honey, you know, down in Florida, Georgia. 
Many people love it. It's kind of become commercial. You can find it in a lot of places, but um, there's something really special about it because it only comes from that one region. And the bees have to be put on boats and floated to access the nectar for the tupelo trees. So after the bees are on the boat for two to three weeks gathering nectar and and the bloom is complete, the bees are floated back to the shore and those big heavy boxes, those bee boxes that are full of honey are extremely heavy and have to be carefully taken off the boats and brought into the honey house for extraction. So the reason that Tupelo Honey has such a mystique about it is because Van Morrison had written a song about Tupelo Honey and Yuli's Gold, that movie with Peter Fonda, was um, all about a beekeeper who was harvesting Tupelo honey. And just the the mere labor intensity of accessing the the Tupelo plants make this honey sort of very romantic and very, um, very desirable. Now, where do you go to buy some of these other honeys if you can't find it in the grocery store? I mean, if somebody wants to start trying different types of honeys, where's the best place for them to start? I mean, obviously, you can get stuff online, and there's websites uh, like Local Harvest where you can actually buy from uh, producers, farmers, and beekeeper producers. But really, you know, we like to encourage people that when they're traveling to visit beekeepers and farmers markets in their area. All right, so next time you're traveling, you're driving down the road, you see a bee, just follow it home. Just see where it goes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even in other countries, too, it it stands the same. You know, you can be driving through a farmer's market or, or one of the street festivals, and you'll always find honey, and you will always be able to talk to the beekeeper. They'll let you taste their honey. They'll tell you everything they know about it. And you come home with a bottle of, like, just liquid gold with an amazing story. Marina Marchese, you are the owner of Red Bee Honey. You are also the founder of the American Honey Tasting Society. And the new book is The Honey Connoisseur. Uh, People can find out more about you at redbee.com. You're also going to be speaking at the Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference September 21st in Providence, Rhode Island. People can find details on that at tastetrekkers.com. If people want to follow you on social media, how can they do that? I'm on Twitter a lot these days, Red Bee Marina, having a lot of fun with that. I'm on Facebook. Uh, the book is on Facebook. Both books are on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Good. And, and you can find the book uh, on Amazon as well? Yep. Anywhere books are sold. Yep. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm, I'm pumped to see you at the Food Tourism Conference. I can't wait. This well, is going to be thank exciting. thank you so much. I'm very excited to be a part of it. My name is Seth Ressler. This is the Fine Dining Podcast. couple of show notes before we go. First of all, please head over to tastetrekkers.com. Check out everything that's going on with the Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference. Uh, If you uh, want to subscribe to the show or find links to any of the things that we mentioned here, you can just uh, head over to the website. While you're there, subscribe in iTunes and leave a review. That helps us out. You can also follow us on Twitter or on Facebook. And if you want to be a guest, you want to come on the podcast and tell everybody about your local dining scene, we would love to have you. Just click one of the contact us links and send us an email and we will get in touch with you. Thank you so much for listening. This is the Find Dining Podcast. You can find links to the places mentioned in this episode at tastetrekkers.com. Tastetrekkers.com. Thank you for listening.